So in this lecture, we're going to start examining the properties of fluid flow. Now, most of the properties we've looked at so far, both when we were talking about elasticity and fluid statics, were concerned with bulk properties of a material, so the whole volume of material. But one effect that's important to fluids is the surface, and there's an effect known as the surface tension of a fluid. Now, this comes about because the molecules on the surface of a liquid are only bonded on one side. So the weak bonds, they're, they're very weak, they allow the molecules to move past one another, otherwise we wouldn't have a fluid. But nevertheless, there are weak bonds inside uh, a liquid, and so the molecules on the surface of the liquid have fewer of these bonds, and so they're in a higher energy state. And so this gives the surface of a liquid an energy per unit area, which is what gives rise to a surface tension. And it makes the surface of the fluid behave as if it's a membrane that has a tension on it. And this is also the reason why the surface of fluids are smooth. Right? If you look at a water in a container, it has a very smooth surface on top of it. It's not rough and jagged. And the reason for that is, is that the larger the surface, the more energy that's required to create it. And so liquids um, act in a way and flow in a way so as to minimize this surface area. Now, what we're going to see in a minute is a little demo that shows you that in some cases, when you're dealing with small objects, this surface tension can actually be quite an important effect. So, to see the action of surface tension, what we've got here is a beaker of water that has a paper clip floating on the top. And if I move the beaker slightly, you can see that the paper clip floats around with the water. Now, Archimedes' principle tells us that this shouldn't happen. A uh, paperclip is made of steel that's a lot denser than water, and so it should sink. But the paperclip is light enough that it hasn't broken the surface tension of the water, and it's this surface tension that is lifting the paperclip up and stopping it from sinking into the body of the water. And to show you that the paperclip really will sink if we break the surface tension, what I'm going to do is add a little bit of uh, soapy water with detergent in it, which will va vastly reduce the surface tension of the water, and so it will no longer be able to support the paperclip, and you should see it sink. And there it goes. So you can see now that when we remove the effect of the surface tension using detergent, the paperclip does indeed follow uh, Archimedes' principle and sink to the bottom of the water. So now we've looked at surface tension, we want to have a look at how fluids flow, and more interestingly, what types of flow there are. Now one of the best examples in nature of fluid flow is water flowing in a river. Unfortunately, in Edmonton in the winter, this is not an easy thing to observe because everything's frozen. So here we are in the middle of Geneva in Switzerland, and what we're seeing is the River Rhone flowing out of Lake Geneva and through the city centre. Now what you can see, if you look at the surface here, is you can see various ripples as, current, as the current moves the water through the city. Now if we look a little bit more closely at where the water flows under the bridge, we can get an idea of the two types of fluid flow that occur. Now if we look at this bridge, in the middle of the arches, we can see that the surface of the water is relatively smooth. There's a few ripples, but in general, it's relatively smooth. The reason it's smooth is partly due to the surface tension, which always acts to minimize the surface area of the water, but also because the water velocity is constant at a particular point. And this is an example of what we call laminar flow where the planes of molecules of the water are moving smoothly over the top of each other. But if you look closely next to the supports for the bridge, you can see that there's a lot more uh, rough surface to the water, and this is caused by eddies and upwellings from below, and this is an example of what we call turbulent flow. And if we look at it closely, you can actually see little whirlpools being scattered and coming off the sides of the bridge. And this is an example of what we call turbulent flow. The other interesting thing to note is that you do get these upwellings of water from below, 
because fluid flow is a three-dimensional phenomenon. Now for most of this course we will deal with fluid flow as two-dimensional but in general it is a three-dimensional phenomenon. So let's see if we can separate out these two types of fluid flow. So here we are at another river in Europe. This is the river Ouse that flowing through the centre of the city of York in northern England. And as you can see, the flow is so smooth that you can barely see any motion at all and you have to look carefully to show that the river is actually flowing. Now this is an example of pure laminar flow. It's a very slow moving river, there are no obstructions and the water surface is completely smooth and we're seeing a perfect example of this laminar type of flow. So here we are looking at Gunnerside Gill in Swaledale, about 100 kilometers from where we were before in York. And this is an excellent example of turbulent flow. All the rocks and boulders in the stream bed are causing the water to flow around them and as it does so it introduces eddies and swirls and we get at a single point the velocity of the water is not constant and this is the defining characteristic for turbulent flow. So now we've seen examples of laminar and turbulent flow both mixed together in the Rhone in Geneva and then separately in the ooze at York where we saw laminar flow and here in Gunnerside where we're seeing turbulent flow. But what about in the lab? In fact it turns out it's very easy to reproduce these two types of flow. It doesn't even need a lab, you can do it in the home with a simple tap. So there are two types of fluid flow and what we're seeing here on the screen, although it looks like nothing's actually happening, is called laminar flow and this is where the velocity at any point in the liquid remains a constant with time and as you can see it's characterized with a very smooth surface to the liquid that's flowing out of the tap. Now this is the other sort of fluid flow it's called chaotic flow and as you can see the fluid no longer has a smooth surface it's moving in all directions, in fact it's breaking up, it's overcoming the surface tension due to the increased velocity of the fluid. But what happens here is that the fluid velocity at any single point in space changes over time and is not a constant. And so this is what we call turbulent flow. It's very difficult to describe mathematically and for most of this course we're going to be concerned only with laminar flow. So now we've seen laminar and turbulent flow demonstrated both at the home and in nature and what we're looking at now is another example of turbulent flow um, in the center of Geneva again but this one is caused by speed and what we're seeing is the jet d'eau which is French for jet of water which is a 140 meter fountain right in the heart of Geneva on the shores of Lake Geneva. This originally started as a pressure release valve for a factory but in the late 1800s it was located here and upgraded somewhat. It's now a 200 km an hour jet of water that uses electric pumps that consume a megawatt of power to generate the huge jet that you can see. Now this is an example of turbulent flow caused by speed. The velocity of the water is so high that it overcomes the surface tension and mixes with the air so that you get a jet which is a mixture of air and water and the flow is not constant at a particular point and so therefore it's turbulent flow. Now the next question is we've seen all these examples of flow but how do we describe fluid flow in a pipe and to do that we have to use certain conservation laws so let's have a look at a little bit more detail in that on the computer screen. Now the fluid flow that we're going to be concerned with is governed by Newtonian mechanics and Newtonian mechanics has several important conservation laws and one of these conservation laws is the conservation of mass. Now mass is not conserved in relativity but for Newtonian mechanics mass is a constant. So what we've got here is we've got a system 
of a fluid flowing through a pipe and the pipe narrows. From initially having an area of A1, it narrows to having a cross-sectional area of A2. And so the question is, what does this mean for the speed of the fluid flowing through the pipe? So if we think that in one unit of time here, we have some volume here of fluid that enters the pipe. So this is the um, volume of fluid that's going into the pipe in one unit of time. And then coming out of the pipe, we're going to have another volume of fluid here that leaves the pipe. Now, the mass coming in is going to be this volume of fluid here multiplied by the density. So we're going to have the density multiplied by this volume. Well, if we look at this pipe, it's got a cross-sectional area A1, and so we've got a cylinder here, and so this is going to be rho times A1. And then the length of this pipe is the essentially the distance that the fluid flows in one unit of time. Well, the velocity is the distance moved per unit time, so the length that the uh, a surface of this fluid would move, or the length that a, a, a piece of fluid would move in one unit of time is V1. And so the volume of this cylinder is just A1 times V1. And this is the mass that enters the system. Now, the mass that comes out of the system well, here we have to be a little bit careful. So we assumed a particular density coming in, and let's actually call that rho 1. Now coming out, we'll assume that the density may not be the same, so we'll call that rho 2. And then the volume of liquid that has come out of here is going to be the cross-sectional area of the pipe. So that's A2, because that dis determines the cross-sectional area of our cylinder of liquid here. And then the length here, because we're coming out with a velocity V2, and we want the amount that's come out per unit time, then this is going to be V2. Now, with conservation of mass, these two quantities must be equal to one another. So we have rho 1 times A1 times V1 must equal rho 2 times A2 times V2. But if the fluid is um, incompressible, and this is typically the case for many liquids. Now, liquids are not perfectly incompressible, but to a very good approximation, they do not compress. Then what this will mean is that rho 1 is equal to rho 2, assuming that we can't compress the liquid, because that would mean that the density is constant. And so in that case, we could cancel these two terms, and we end up with A1 times V1 is equal to A2 times V2. And this is known as the continuity equation. Now, what does this mean? Well, if you remember, if you think about it when you were a kid, you would sometimes stick your finger over the end of a tap, or if you were in fact watering a garden with a hose pipe and you haven't got a sprinkler, you can stick your finger over the end of the hose pipe, and what you find is that the speed of water increases. And that is a result of the continuity equation. So if you start with your big wide pipe, you have a large cross-sectional area, and so you have, and you have a velocity. Well, if suddenly you shrink that cross-sectional area, say you halve it, then because the product of the cross-sectional area and the velocity is constant for an incompressible fluid flowing through the pipe, then if you halve the area, you must double the velocity. And so essentially that's why sticking your finger over the end of a tap or the end of a hose pipe causes the fluid in the hose pipe to emerge with a higher velocity because it has to satisfy the continuity equation. Of course, it also has to have enough driving force behind it that it will um, you know, overcome the resistance that you essentially you've now created by covering up half the exit. But that's why the velocity of fluid increases when you partially cover a pipe.